Galatians chapter 2 this morning, if you would. Galatians chapter 2, and the majority of the rest of the morning, here just for about a half of an hour, we're going to be in the book of Romans, chapter number 6 and chapter number 7. And we have been dealing in the Sunday morning hour about the crucified life, what it means to us as believers. And we were going through these nice little alphabetical ordered apostasy and we talked about the bride of Christ and we talked about baptism and then we got to see and the Lord just sort of said just slow down right there for a minute and I think we've preached about four messages on this subject of living the crucified life and we're going to just try to condense some things today and perhaps either this week or next week will be the last uh, message on this subject of crucified with Christ but We look at Galatians chapter 2 and we see Paul's declaration of his life. He simply says in Galatians chapter 2 in verse number 20, I am crucified with Christ. It's important that we identify ourselves with the Lord. And it's important to understand that when Christ was dying for our sins, he was dying to take take our sins from us, and he did take our sins on him. The Bible even says that he bore him, our sins in himself, the scripture says. I believe that's in the book of Colossians. So Christ didn't just take our sins upon him, but according to the scripture, he bare in his body our sins. That's what the Bible declares. That's an amazing thing to think. And I believe that's what Jesus was referring to when he said, nevertheless, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. It was the idea that he would receive from every human being, every evil deed, thought, action, all of the evil that anyone could have ever done or would do. Jesus not only took upon himself, but think about this, he took within himself. The scripture says that uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter number 5, for God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, who knew no sin. And what a moment in time. And, and it's, it really, we say it and we just don't really grasp it, do we? We say, oh, he took all the sins of humankind. Well, just, just stop for a minute and think about all the sin that you've committed in your life. Would you say thousands? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. And then you think about this whole room. Now we're up into hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, if you would. And then you go outside and you just say, your county. And then you go out beyond that and you say, you know, uh, York City, if you would, New York County, and then you go to Pennsylvania, and now you're up to over millions, right? And then you go into the whole country, and then, well, you're in billions of sins. I mean, am I, am I thinking rationally here this morning? Yeah. So we just say the word sins, and we just think, oh, yeah, Jesus just took it. How many sins was it that Jesus can't, took upon his body? And no wonder the Bible says that he dreaded that moment where he would bear the sins of many, the scripture says. And we just think of that word like many, like it's just such a little thing. Oh yeah, he died for the, for the world. But, but think about that for a minute. Billions and billions. And for 6,000 years, he took all of that. If Jesus would return, we're about 6,000 years. All of that, all of those sins of every human being that ever came into this world. And here's the amazing part, even the ones that wouldn't receive him as their savior. He took even their sins. That's amazing to think about that. And so the Bible says here in Galatians 2.20 that Paul is identifying this idea. He is saying, I'm crucified with Christ. When Christ died on Calvary, I was with him. In fact, the Bible says, simply put, and why is that? Have you ever thought about why Paul could identify with the crucifixion of Christ? Because he certainly wasn't at Calvary. And how can we identify with the crucifixion of Christ? Because the old man was crucified with Christ. Go with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Again, this is a declaration, an understanding. And uh, Mary here has been playing some real pretty songs at the house. And I think she might have played Were You There the other day. I'm not certain. Um, But there's an old song, Were You There When Jesus Died? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? And I know I'm not saying all the words right here, but man, that's a great song. Taking you to that place. And I think the song infers more than the idea that we just see that he's done those things. I think it's the idea that we realize when he died on Calvary, he did it for me. 
He took my sins. In fact, what he took was my old man to Calvary with him. And says in Romans chapter 6 here, Romans chapter 6, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So God says that he took our sins and in the sense he also took our old man with him to the cross. We have been, as the Bible says here, verse 4, not only that we've been uh, baptized into his death or been crucified with him, but he says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, that's important to understand too. The Bible so clearly here shows to us that baptism is a picture of that burial. And it says these words, the likeness. That's important, the likeness of his death. It says planted, down in, right? And it also uh, uses uh, the word here that he was buried that he was buried. So two words, and that's why I believe the only proper baptism is a submersion because burial and also planting, these two words and giving the idea of being put down in, put in. God uses these words, the likeness of burial and the likeness of planting to describe baptism and the death, if you would, that comes to the old man when we get saved. And God says it so clearly here. Verse 6, notice, if you would, knowing this, that, there it is, our old man is crucified with him. Now, I'm, I keep wanting to say this. So I'm just going to get it out of the way. Um, it keeps coming up because in our vernacular today, the old man is a bad phrase. And we should never call, oh, that's the old man. That's the old man. But this is not what it's talking about. This is talking about the unborn, the lost creature that we were before we get saved. Now watch. Go with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Brother Jake used this verse in his testimony um, on our CD. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Why can we be a new creature? Amen. Some of us was... Some bad creatures before, but uh, thank God we are new creatures. The idea here is the new creation, one that's been made in Christ. It says in verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, in Christ. Why does it say in Christ? Because when we got saved, our old man was crucified with Christ. And now our new man is one with Christ. That God took away that middle wall. The Bible says that partition, that, that, that veil of the flesh that was keeping us from coming to God. And it says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Why? Why is that? And in fact, in verse number um 15 and 16, we see the answer. And that he died for all, that they which should live, which live, should not henceforth live unto themselves, which is to say, living the crucified life, not living to self, but it says, unto him which died for them and rose again. Verse 16, this is great, guys. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. The Bible says, in the Spirit of God, when we got born again, we now know the Lord. Our spirit, the Bible says, becomes one with God's spirit. In the, before, people know Christ, and you'll see it in this world. They'll talk about Jesus, and they'll know him in the flesh. But, buddy, when they get saved, they know him in the spirit. And there is a big difference. This is why the Bible says, many in the last day in Matthew chapter 7 will say unto me, unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works? Have we not cast out devils? And then will I profess unto them what? I never knew you. That is not talking about the flesh. Because every person's name is either going to be written in the book of life or it's going to be written in that, I should say, not in the book of life, but in the book of the living. And the Bible describes this in the scripture. 
that there is two books, one of the saved and one of those who are alive in the flesh, but one day their flesh dies and they die and go to hell. That's called the book of the living. And those two things are separate, by the way, if you study that out. So this is great to know this because God knows every, every creature that's come into this world in the flesh. But as a born-again believer, we're known in the Spirit of God. We're known of Him. That's why the Bible says we know God. And then in 1 John it says, but rather we are known of Him. It's referring to the new creature in Christ. And certainly God knows who are His children. Now, go back here to Romans. Romans. That's why the Bible says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There is something that is particular in the life of the believer. They're not living unto themselves. They're not living unto the old man anymore. They're living unto the new life. They're, as the Bible says in Romans 6, 4, they're walking in the newness of life because the old man has been planted. The old man has been buried with him in baptism by baptism unto death. It's a picture of what took place in our life when we got saved. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. What is the crucified life? Simply put, the crucified life is realizing what Jesus did on Calvary was not just for eternity, but was for my life today. That's what the crucified life is. That God has not just saved me from the penalty of my sin, which was death, and hell in the lake of fire, but he has also saved me from the power of sin presently in my life today. That's what the crucified life is. Christians often say, well, I just can't stop. Yes, you can if you will appropriate and realize what Christ did on Calvary for you. Go to the cross and find one sin that wasn't nailed there to the cross with Jesus. Go to the cross and find one thing that God did not settle that day when he said it is finished. You won't find anything. But friend, let me say something else that's even greater. Let's get to the grave where the stone was rolled back, where Jesus rose again, and give me any sin that God does not have power over to conquer, including death. And there's none. So this is what the crucified life is really understanding, that God not only did this on Calvary so that I would be with Him for eternity, but God did this on Calvary so that I could live a life heavenly before I get to heaven. Yes, it is in fact possible. The assimilation of these ideas of noticing, like Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, and then he goes on to say the rest. Nevertheless, I live. Not the old man, the new man. And the life that I now live, I live, not a coincidence, he said that word three times, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Three times he said the word live. Three days Jesus was in the grave. Now, so here back in Romans, we come again to this idea that this baptism is an identification with. It's not a saving of our soul in the sense of washing away sins, but it is an outward sign of a thing that has happened in our life. Watch with me now. Here we are upright in the water. We have been crucified with Christ. We've been saved by His grace. When a believer gets saved, they've, their sins have been with Christ on Calvary. They've been buried with Him. As the Scripture says here in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, we're buried with Him by baptism into death. It's an identifying with the idea that we have been baptized with Him in His death and we raise again to walk in the newness of life. The old man dies and the new man comes to life. But that doesn't end the day we get saved. We need to continue to identify with that in the crucified life. That's really what it's all about. In fact, the Bible says here that this uh, baptism is always a picture of an identification with Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 here. Every person who has been delivered out of Egypt needs to go through the water. <laughs> Let's say that again. Egypt's always a picture of world. Egypt's always a picture of sin. I mean, it's no coincidence that uh, in the book of Exodus, Moses came and God instructed him how to do the Passover. The blood was their deliverance out of Egypt. After they got delivered out of Egypt, they passed through the Red Sea. Friend, they were already delivered when they got to the Red Sea. Amen. 
But I, I, I just want to say something here very quickly. And this is important to understand that. The Bible says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, I'm not talking about an eternal work. When you get born again, you're saved forever and ever. But I do believe that the person that follows the Lord in baptism in their life gets new deliverance, gets new blessings. Just frankly said, you're blessed of God when you're obedient to God. And yet, in, in my life, I have seen people that are saved that say, I'm not going to get baptized. Give me a scriptural reason not, because every person in the Bible after they were saved were baptized if they had the opportunity, the ones that wanted to walk with the Lord. And even in the Old Testament, there's a picture of that baptism. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the ones that were delivered by God followed the Lord through the water. Watch with me if you would. I, you can't give me, and listen to me, if I believe if a person says, I don't think you need to get baptized after you get saved, I don't believe they're right with God. Because God does not lead you to do something that is contrary to his word. Amen. And I, I'll say something further. I don't believe every church has the authority to baptize someone. If they're not preaching the word of God and you were baptized by a church that's not scripturally preaching the word of God, that's not the kind of church you want to be baptized by. You want to be baptized by God's church, God's people. They were the ones that came through the cloud. And that's been a struggle with some people. And I've seen some people, they say, well, you know, it really doesn't matter who baptizes you. Okay, well, then let's go to the Pope. Oh, it does matter then, doesn't it? That's a good one right there, isn't it? You say, why would you bring up the most extreme? Because the truth is, somewhere between God's holy word and the New Testament church that he planted and that apostate Whore church that we see going on is a bunch of in-between stuff. And I got news for you. If I was part of any of that in-between stuff, I'd make sure I got baptized by the right church. Yeah. And I did, by God's grace. But it took me a couple years to open my eyes up to that truth. Amen. That's right. That's right. I don't know why we don't have a crowd here this morning. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. Because not everybody would like right there what I just said. That's right. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, again, I didn't say you can't go to heaven if you didn't get baptized by a good Bible-believing church. I didn't say that. But I just believe it's the right thing to do. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Whoo! Look at that. That's what it says. They were so. Here's a picture of baptism in the Old Testament. Already the Red Sea. Big coincidence, right there, right? <laughs> that God brought them through the Red Sea. And by the way, it wasn't on top of the Red Sea. And some water sprinkled on their head. They did go through on dry ground. You understand that. But the fact was, they were under the sea. Right on dry ground. The water was above them. Another perfect picture, which I've never seen before, of why submersion, I believe, is the only scriptural mode of baptism. And again, if you wonder, you say, well, I'm not quite sure if my baptism was scriptural. If you've done anything but been dunked, that's a good indication that you've been baptized the wrong way. I believe that beyond a shadow of a doubt. So I'd get that figured out first of all. All right, so let's go on here. Uh, Romans chapter 6. Let's go back there. Romans chapter 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Watch. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now again, this is the realization we need. We need to appropriate this into our life. Paul declared it. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And how is he living his new life? He's living it by the faith of the Son of God who loved him and gave himself for him. He said, verse 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no dominion over him. Aha, here's the appropriation. So if I was in Christ and death had no power over him and sin had no power over him, then that means the death and the sin of this world has no power over him me. Christian, if I could just give you a symbol of what it looks like when a believer willfully sins against God and knows that they don't have to, it's like this. Please tie me up. 
please cuff me up. We're free. We don't have to be in bondage. Now the, now the lost person, they're going, oh, I can't get out. And they can't. They can't. Even in Alcoholics Anonymous, they stop drinking. Good for them. But they're not free from the rest of their sin. They're still bound by that. Yeah. And the one thing they're not free of is death. They can't be free of that. But we don't have anything on us today as believers. And the Bible says, for it's again, death hath no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Here it is, the appropriation. Get this. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray.